You can know every little detail about every little thing in all the textbooks and still not get a great score on the MCAT because it's about how you think. George, welcome to the MCAT podcast. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to chat with you. Uh, you are a rising M2 in medical school up in the great white north in Canada. That is correct. You're a blueprint live online instructor as well. So finding mm -hmm. some time to help out those following in your footsteps. I'm excited uh, in this episode to just drive into or dive into some of your thought process behind the MCAT kind of strengths and weaknesses that you see with students that you um, you help through the Blueprint Live Online platform. And I'm really interested, having having gone through your first year of medical school now, let's start with how being a good MCAT taker uh, uh, has prepared you to be a good medical student. Any, any translation of skills there? 110%. You know, I think... When it comes to the MCAT, well, one of the obviously things, not statistics because 110% yes. doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, right? But in terms of the approach, the approach is very analytical when you come to the MCAT. Like a lot of people think it's like a content based exam, mm -hmm. which is true to a certain extent. Like you need to learn the stuff, you need to learn, you know, XYZ pathway, you need to learn how it all fits together. But it is fundamentally an application exam. And you'll see in med school how everything clicks together, how this disease is similar to that disease, but it's actually different in these very minute ways. Mm -hmm. This is all an application framework, like a strategic way of approaching these different cases or approaching different passages, things that you read. So a lot of those skills are super transferable when you're studying for the MCAT to approach it from this framework of, okay, there's some stuff that I do know and some stuff that I don't know. How can I use what I do know to go in, figure out the stuff that I don't know, right? Connecting the dots, coming up with the answers by figuring it out, by looking at a graph, not necessarily just like memorizing something and regurgitating it back. Because even in med school, it's very application based. You're going to see new stuff all the time. It's how you how you click things together that counts. Yeah. So I, as a student listening to that goes, okay, well, it's all it's all well and good to to apply things, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the things that they're asking me to apply. So how do I even get to that point? And and I'm sure it's similar in med school. Obviously, I've, I've been through the process. Uh, yeah, you you have to know it all before you can apply it all. So how do you how do you do that too? The biggest thing that I always tell people is make it engaging for yourself, right? Like the idea of active recall over passive reading. I tell all my students it's like you can read your notes a million times and it probably won't be there. It's the same thing. I can click through my slides in med school. I can read through them, but it's not going to be there when I need it on test day or when I'm dealing with patients. If you make it engaging for yourself, even if it's like at the most simple level, you look at the concept name and you're like, um, the nephron, let's just, we're, ta we're talking about kidneys, right? And you start to describe, you're like, okay, these are the different parts of the nephron. We start with, you know, the glomerulus, the Bowman's capsule, and you kind of like draw it out with your fingers, like make it as engaging as possible. I always try to engage as many systems. So like visually, I'm looking at a diagram. Verbally, I'm speaking it out loud. I'm going to use my hands and like draw it out as I explain it. The more ways you can engage yourself with that learning and make it active for yourself, it's going to be, it's going to stick so much better. So a lot of my peers use like flashcards, Anki decks, like any which way that you can make it so that it's active recall. You're going to engage yourself and force yourself to pull it from your memory as opposed to just like reading things over and over. If you can pull it from memory one or two or three times, mm -hmm. do that like a couple of weeks apart or like repeat it every now and then it's going to be there when you need it so if i were to make an assumption i would probably say a, a big mistake that you see our students for the mcat prepping for the mcat is is that passive uh passive learning they're just sitting in front of their their blueprint book kaplan book whatever and and they're just like trying to stay awake because they're sitting there with their eyes propped open going, I, so I can't, much content, I can't yeah. keep reading um, and, and then three months in, they're finally like, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to do my diagnostic now. Yeah, that's, it's definitely, as you just said, it's a very common mistake. And I think, you know, I'm sure some of our listeners can relate, but have you ever felt like you were reading something and you're kind of zoned out? Maybe you're tired, but like you've read three, four <laughs> paragraphs and you're like, what's going Like what? What did I read? Yeah. What did I just read? Right. Yeah. What's going on? And like, that's the danger of the passive reading because you're physically looking at it, but you're not internalizing it. If you make it active for yourself, there's tons of quizzes online. Like for my amino acids, I found this thing on Sporkle. It was just this quick, like they would show you the images and you just have to type in the one letter code, the three letter code, the name of it, make it fun for yourself. 
pull it back from memory. If you can make it engaging, you'll actually learn. You can spend three, four hours reading notes, but it's not productive time if you're not actually internalizing anything versus like one hour of very engaged learning actually goes a lot further. But what if it's just a wall of dry text, right? The, in the in the the section that I'm studying right now, there's there's nothing fun to look at. There's no pictures. It's just text after text after text. How do you make that engaging? 110. percent You got to relate it back to your own life. You know, I think the classic is with psych soch. The psychology and sociology section in particular is like there's some diagrams to explain certain things, but really it's like a bunch of theories, a bunch of names, a bunch of people, if you can make it real for yourself. So like conditioning, for example, they always use like Pavlov's dogs to talk about conditioning. Mm -hmm. You're probably not going to see a question on the exam word for word. That's like, oh, like Pavlov had his dogs <laughs> and like he rang a bell. What was this like unconditioned or it's not going to be that simple, yep. but they're going to take the same concept and apply it to new contexts. And so I really encourage your listeners or any student like hoping to learn more dry content or like theories and whatnot, try to relate it to your own life. Try to find ways to connect it with other information you already know. Try to like come up with your own examples of like, you know, the cocktail party. I imagine myself like I'm just like chilling with friends or at a cocktail party and someone says my name, George, and I turn around and I'm like, oh, like I can hear my name despite all the other noise. I'm like, that's an example of the cocktail party. <laughs> Right. I literally, I literally last night <laughs> got mad at my wife because she, when, whenever we go upstairs to go to bed, right? I have two kids, an eight-year-old and an almost four-year-old. Okay. And when we go and close their doors, make sure their their blankets are covering them, she says goodnight to them. Like she literally talks out loud. And I'm like, you do understand that our brains have the ability to to like listen even while we're sleeping yeah. to make sure that we're going to be safe. And if you talk to them, they're going to wake up. Like, don't talk to them. <laughs> it's like asking your kids, are you asleep when they're already yeah. asleep? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, don't do that. I did, yeah. and that's literally like when I was when I was like telling her, and obviously she's a doctor; she knows these things. I, like literally, I'm I, the the example that popped in my mind is that classic example of being in the room full of a thousand people, and someone says your name, and you're like, ooh, I I heard my name. You just like zone into it. Exactly. Yeah. So if you if you come up with these stories, like it just makes it more fun and makes it more real as opposed to just like cocktail party. What can that be, right? So yeah, for sure, I love that. Oh man! So let let's talk about the the student um, as we're going to jump back into the diagnostic here. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of students are scared of diagnostic exams. I, I think a lot of it is ego related. They don't want to mm -hmm. see a bad score, so they'd rather study for a long time before jumping in and getting that first score. Mm -hmm. What is what is your sales pitch to get everyone to go to blueprintmcat.com, go get a free account, get this diagnostic, and just take it sight unseen. So the biggest thing right now is that coming back to this idea of ego, and we see it with people taking full lengths as well. They're like, I, I just, I can't, I don't feel prepared enough. I don't want to take this full length. It's going to be a wasted opportunity. I'm going to tell you right now, like I ended up scoring a 524 on my final, like AMC that's official it? MCAT. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> only, only a hundredth percentile. But my first full length was like a five, 500 flat. And then I got like a 505, got a 517, a 512, 518, like slowly went up. But the idea is, you need to take these diagnostics because the point of the diagnostic is to diagnose what you know and what you don't know. You want to establish a baseline for yourself from the get-go. You'll notice, again, it's not just content. There's a lot of questions you can approach with a strategic approach that makes it a lot simpler than doing all the math or figuring out all the nitty-gritty details and connecting it all there. Because like, oftentimes if it's like you know a Roman numeral question or if you see two questions that are identical, like you can eliminate them and then just yep. look at a 50-50 as opposed to just guessing like one and yep. four, right? So definitely take that diagnostic because you can't work on what you don't know until you figure out what you don't know. Yeah. So by taking that step, taking the diagnostic, taking that leap of faith and accepting, even if I don't do well on this, it'll show me all the opportunities and areas that I need to improve that I can improve to ultimately improve my score on the day when it counts. It's, it's funny you mentioned that. I was uh, recently, uh, I went on to Apple Podcasts and was looking at reviews of the MCAT podcast. Mm. And the biggest negative review consistently is, Ryan doesn't know what he's talking about. He's too far separated from the basic science content to to help me understand. They just want to get to the answer. Yeah. And, and I kind of chuckle to myself because I'm like, the whole point of me doing this is to help people 
those who aren't arrogant enough to go, I just need to know the answer, to help people understand the thought process behind how to think through these questions. Because mm. I get a lot of questions right not knowing anything. Yeah, exactly. And so my goal, hopefully, and, and, and the, the most common positive feedback that I get is your thought process, just listening to your thought process, helped me understand how I was doing it all wrong, mm. and now I understand and, and my scores are better. So it, it's kind of funny that you went there because I was reminded that there are people out there that's like, just give me the answer, I just need to know the answer. I'm like, no, that's not the point of this test. Yeah, So I think just to like continue on that idea, I think the MCAT is really good at making core concepts look really difficult. As in, I promise you right now, if you have the MCAT coming up, you're planning to write it, you can do all the full lengths, you can do like all the practice questions in the world, you will see new, quote unquote, new things on the actual MCAT. Yeah. They're testing the same core principles and ultimately the same core strategies and approach. That's why the mindset and the thought process is so important because they're going to throw things at you that are distracting. They're going to big, ugly figures, these long gene names, these long, whatever alphabet soup, right? They're going to throw things at you, but it's about how you approach it. It's not just knowing the answer. That's why like a lot of these like practice questions, review questions, you can look at the answer, you can understand the answer, but you're probably never going to see another question word for word like that again, right? So that yeah. specific piece of content knowledge is actually nowhere near as important as the ability to read a question, think, okay, this is exactly what the question is asking me, paraphrasing it. Um, these are what the answers are. I'm going to glaze it over. I'm going to compare them briefly. Okay, maybe these are the differences. I'm going to lock into, let's say, C. Yeah. That's a thought process. And that process is so much more important than being able just to say, okay, I understand why, you know, uh, ethyl pentane butanol is this solvent for this case. Like, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, you want to focus on the strategy, not the specifics. Yeah. And it's actually interesting because I think a lot of students, depending on the university that they go to, they focus a lot on the answer because at a lot of schools, old tests are available. So you can kind of get a sense of how the questions are asked and the specific mm. professor. And, and I don't think professors spend as much time rewriting questions and coming up with new questions like the AAMC does. And so studying those old tests are is really helping them for their tests in, in college because the questions are the same. The numbers may just be different. And how they approach the questions are going to be the same. The numbers are just different. So And the names change, right? Sally turns into Stevie or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so like, oh, it's a new question. Wait, no, it's not. It's the same. <laughs> no, it's not. No, no yeah, it's come not. on. Let's be real. Yeah. So uh, someone going into a diagnostic exam, they go mm -hmm. and take it. You scored a 500. I, I always see kind of 494, 495. And that's super disheartening. How does a student look at that number and not internalize, oh my gosh, I'm a failure? This is a really good question. And I think this, if you take a step back, this is something I always tell my mentees. It's it's about that growth mindset, right? At any point in your life, you can look at something and like, you know, maybe you missed out on a scholarship. Maybe you applied something, you didn't get it. Maybe any which way you sent an email to a prof, they didn't respond, right? Some sort of setback. You look at it and it's not ideal and it's disheartening because you're like, you know what? I tried my best and it's not the result I was hoping for. But there's two stages to that. One, you can you can just say, okay, you know what? I'm not good enough and I can give up. It's possible. You can decide to do that, right? But where is that going to get where is that going to get you? The alternative route is to take this and say, listen, I didn't get the score I wanted, but like that also makes sense. I haven't started studying yet. Like I haven't tried new strategies. I haven't, you know, I'm proud of the answers that I got right. It's nice that I retained this from, you know, my first, second year, whatever organic chemistry, gen chem class. Great. I remember how titrations work. It's <laughs> great, you know? But there's a lot that's still to be learned. And remember that none of your diagnostics count towards your actual MCAT score. Like no, no one looks at your diagnostic score. No one looks at your full length scores. The actual score is on test day. Like their test day score is the only one that matters. And if you can start with a point now, identify those weaknesses, look at these wrong answers as an opportunity for growth right? Converting those wrong, those weak areas into strong areas. That's how you're going to improve your score to the day that it actually matters. That's how you're going to ultimately increase your real score, which people are going to use for med school applications. It doesn't matter at this stage. The only value that you have in getting questions wrong is that you actually identify what your weak areas are so you can target them. If you don't identify those weak areas, you know, flash forward six months and like you started taking your first full length and then you write your exam right after, you can't really like you can't expect a better score because like you haven't tried. 
-hmm. You haven't tried taking the test. The test is a different beast than learning content, right? It's, it's again, the test is about application. You can know every little detail about every little thing in all the textbooks and still not get a great score on the MCAT because it's about how you think. How you think. That's awesome. All right, let's, uh, let's wrap this one up. We're going to jump sure. into or continue our breakdown of the Blueprint MCAT diagnostic, diagnostic yeah. in, uh, in our next episode. George, as we wrap up here, what's a final, final word of wisdom or encouragement for the student out there struggling with their MCAT prep? It's a long journey, but take it one step at a time. You know, I think one of the biggest things, and even for the students enrolled right now, in terms of like looking at this mountain, maybe they're falling behind in their prep, maybe they're not sure like how to approach it. When you take a big goal, the easiest way to not get overwhelmed and to continue making process is taking a big goal and splitting it up into very small, discrete chunks. Blueprint study plan does a great job of this because they literally organize everything for you in the terms of like every day you have a checklist. I need to do these modules. I need to do these X, Y, Z homework things. But even in your own prep, this is something I spent the amount of time. I said, I, these are all my books. These are all the topics I need to cover. I organize them day by day. I'm like each day I only need to do four topics, mm -hmm. right? I'm only going to do four topics. I don't care that in the end, it's going to take me like, you know, 200 topics to get to. I'm going to do four topics per day. I'm going to spend, you know, three hours per day. I'm going to do 25 minutes right now, take a little bit of a break and then do another 25 minutes of productive work. When you can, when you can really scale things down to concrete things you can achieve now, it makes these big unscalable mountains actually possible because you just take it one step at a time and you'll find one, two, three weeks in, you've made so much progress and you continue. And by the time you get there, you look back and you're like, wow, I just did that, right? So break it down, take it one step at a time and keep up all your good work. 